So I, I am very happy to introduce Professor uh, Honor uh, uh, Motlu. Uh, and he really has a uh, distinguished record from what I have read from his bio. So we expect a great talk, hopefully. Uh, so he's a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich. If you don't know, it's one of the very best in Europe. I don't know number one or two. It's one of the very top. Uh, he's also a professor in Carnegie Mellon, another top university in the US. Um, and he has uh, invented a lot of things that went into industry. He got his PhD from University of Texas, Austin, and uh, his BS degree from uh, University of Michigan and Arbor in computer engineering and in psychology. So if you need some sessions on the side, I guess uh, Honor can help. Uh, and also he started the computer architecture group uh, uh, at Microsoft Research, uh, which is a prestigious group there. Uh, uh, and he also went into Intel Corporation, several uh, like advised micro devices and so on. Uh, so many prestigious uh, positions in his career, really. Um, he had uh, the IEEE High Performance Computer Architecture Test of Time Award and IEEE Society uh, awards and uh, ACM awards, IEEE awards, National Science Foundation Career Award, which is something very prestigious, Intel Early Career Award, so tons of awards and desk table awards. He's an ACM fellow, he's an IEEE fellow, and he is also a member of the Academy of Europe. I don't know, you look young for all this uh, honor, uh, but uh, that's great. Uh, also, he has all his lectures freely available uh, on a web page. Uh, I guess, Ahmed, you can share the web page in the bio to our students. Mm -hmm. so that can be very be beneficial to them, maybe in the chat even, and so on. So really uh, an amazing record, and we expect a great uh, talk. So please, uh, without further ado, Dr. Honor, uh, we're honored to have you. Thank, thank you very much, Yahya, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Ahmed, especially uh, your efforts uh, in making, making sure that I, res I respond to you. Uh, let me uh, share my screen to start the talk. Uh, okay, I'm going to do that. I hope you can see it. Yes. And yeah, thank you. And I wish I could be delivering this talk in person uh, because I've never been to Egypt. Uh, it would have, it'd be nice actually to come, but actually we'll arrange it once we're out of this Corona mess, you know, uh, sure. we will be honored to arrange it. I can help Ahmed and we can find some, some way to get you in. Sure. Yeah. I would, I would love to come, uh, of course, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully all of us will be out of this, uh, mess sooner rather than later. Hopefully soon. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, shall I start then? Yeah. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about future computing platforms, uh, hopefully lay down some challenges and opportunities that I see uh, in the area of computing platform design, hardware hard and hardware software interfaces and low level and application software. So hopefully it'll be interesting. And this is a long talk. Uh, we will shorten it uh, uh, to as long as it needs to be uh, for this purpose. Uh, but feel free to ask questions if you have uh, uh, any questions anytime, I think. Feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so I'll start with a brief introduction to what I do. Uh, basically, uh, currently, uh, I would like to build fundamentally better computing architectures. And I work in computer architecture, hardware, software, co-design, systems, bioinformatics, and security. And I will touch upon all of these aspects. And these are example things that we work on. Uh, in our research, in my research group, as you can see. And everything related to this is interesting to me. Uh, and these are four key current directions that I'm, oh, sorry about that, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I, uh, we, we work uh, a lot on fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures, because I believe it's going to be very imp even more important going into the future. We tackle the energy efficiency problem by trying to make architectures much more data-centric. And these two things are I'm going to have time to talk about. Probably we will not have time to talk about low latency and predictable architectures and architectures for really important applications. I will touch upon this, but I'm not going to go into uh, much detail. Uh, let me just, just to give you an overview of what I think uh, of computer architecture is if you look at this, this is how computing works today, right? We have problems and we want them to, solve, uh, to be solved by electrons. 
And we build a transformation hierarchy, many abstraction layers, which we will talk about later on also again. Uh, but uh, computer architecture is traditionally considered the hardware software interface and the microarchitecture underneath it. But my take on computer architecture is really broader. We look uh, more uh, across the stack, all the way from algorithms to devices, while still uh, keeping a core at hardware software interface at microarchitecture. And hopefully this will become more clear in this talk. I think we really need this approach uh, to get the highest energy efficiency and performance from our systems today because we just cannot uh, constrain ourselves to one level in that hierarchy that I showed you earlier. We must really take an expanded view of computer architecture and computing system design, co-design across the hierarchy, take an algorithm and uh, co-design everything on, uh, underneath it all the way to the devices and specialize as much as possible, hopefully within the design goals. And hopefully I'll give you examples of this uh, throughout this talk. This is a busy slide uh, that shows what my research group currently works on. I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can read it on your own. I'll make the slides available also. In fact, I believe the video will be available as well. But we do broad, broad research spanning application systems and logic with architecture at the center. And I'm going to talk about some of these as we go along. And this is my research group. This was taken pre-pandemic. Uh, you can see it's a large group right now. And this is a logo uh, that was prepared by my students. And if you want to learn, uh, I'm going to present the research that was done by them. If you want to learn more about uh, more recent research, we released a newsletter in January 2021. You can take a look at it uh, as well. Uh, let me give you a little bit about my philosophy, since a lot of the uh, attendees are, I believe, students, uh, likely from Egypt or maybe all over the world. I believe that uh, teaching and research are really coupled to each other. Uh, teaching drives research. Uh, as you teach something, you come up with new ideas. And research also drives teaching. And these are two sides of the same coin. This is an endless loop, basically. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, the difference between research and teaching is in research, once you find out something, you educate everyone else in the world about something they didn't know before. Whereas in teaching, you educate people in the world about, about things they knew before. That's the only difference, I think. And once research finishes and you come up with something new, it becomes teaching, uh, in my opinion. So I use this principle in my courses and uh, talk about a lot of cutting edge topics uh, so that I can introduce uh, themselves to the students and freshmen uh, currently, for example, at ETH. Uh, we focus a lot on learning and scholarship in my group. I think it's really important. Uh, I feel like there needs to be more emphasis on science uh, going into the future. It feels sometimes like we are losing uh, that emphasis, uh, even in the scientific community. Uh, and we focus a lot on insight and I like encouraging new ideas. So if, you, if anyone comes up with new ideas after this talk, I'm happy to hear them or discuss them. Uh, and uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have our uh, talks as well as uh, lectures online. Feel free to take a look. If you miss any part of this talk, you may actually find a version of it uh, online also. And if you're interested more on the philosophy that I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some talks that talk about that as well which I'm not going to go into. And these are some links you can find. Uh, I think Ahmed put this on the chat, but uh, basically everything uh, that I'm going to talk about, all of the papers, talks, and artifacts are available online. We put them online uh, in different channels, as you can see. Okay, with that uh, backdrop, let's uh, jump into the subject matter of this talk. I'm going to talk about future computing platforms and talk about challenges and opportunities. But I will start with a very basic question uh, which I believe is important and which we shouldn't lose the sight of as we develop systems and computers. And that's why do we do computing? And I think uh, the basic answer uh, to this is to solve problems that we have in many aspects of life. And hopefully we can apply uh, computing to many problems that we have. If you reword this answer to gain insight because computing may not be able to directly solve the problems we have, but uh, at least it can provide us insight with the insight that enables us to uh, tackle the problems that we have. Some of the, sometimes it may be able to solve, sometimes it may not be able to solve, but insight is extremely important. And that was also acknowledged by Richard Hamming in the seminal book uh, where he developed the Hamming codes, for example. Actually, he developed them earlier, but this book, he talks about computing as insight, not numbers. And if you extend the answer, of course, to enable a better life and future, hopefully, by solving the problems. Then the next question becomes, of course, how does a computer solve problems? And that brings us to the uh, hierarchy that, we, uh, that I showed earlier. At least in today's dominant technologies, we try to orchestrate the electrons and get the electrons to move to the right places 
so that we can solve the problems at a very high level. Of course, it's a difficult task uh, because we cannot speak the electron language directly and electrons cannot speak our language directly. That's why we build the hierarchy that I showed you earlier. We have a problem. We want to get it solved by uh, devices that operate using electrons. So we translate the problem to an algorithm, which gets run on, uh, translated to a programming line language, which gets run on system software, which in combination gets compiled down to some hardware software interface, which gets executed on a microarchitecture, which is built on logic gates, which is built on devices that operate based on the principles of electrons. So that's why we have this transformation hierarchy. And as I said earlier, the narrow view of computer architecture is only these two parts. But in this talk, we're going to take an expanded view of computer architecture where we look at uh, algorithms to devices. And hopefully, it'll be exciting. And this is happening today in industry also in computer architecture. But what is computer architecture? Uh, there might be students who may be just getting introduced to this. So I will quickly define what it is. Uh, it's the science and art of designing computing platforms. And in my opinion, as I said, based on that expanded view, it's the hardware, it's the interface, it's the system software, as well as a programming model to take advantage of it. And the goal is to achieve a set of design goals. And this differentiates computer architectures uh, from each other, basically. For example, their design goal in designing a computing platform might be to get the highest performance on Earth on workloads X, Y, Z. This is very specific, clearly. It could be a machine learning workload. It could be a very specific neural network model. It could be a climate modeling application, for example. So this may be the definition of a supercomputer, for example. Usually, you're restricting yourself to a small set of applications, and your goal is very high performance. But you may have a design goal that's completely different. You may want to get the longest battery life at a form factor that fits in your pocket with some cost limit, as you can see. And that may be a mobile system uh, that is in widespread use today. And you may be extremely general purpose. You may want to get the best average performance across all known workloads at a, at a good performance cost ratio. And that's the paradigm of general purpose computing. And you can keep expanding it, of course. Uh, basically, you may, the design goal space is quite large. And in the end, you may actually come up with many, many design goals for the system that you're building. In the end, designing a supercomputer is clearly different from designing a smartphone uh, or a general purpose computer. But many fundamental principles are similar. And computer architecture deals with those fundamental principles, as well as the differences, of course. So it's a broad field from that perspective. Just to uh, give you examples, these are some different platforms that have different goals, design goals, clearly. Uh, this is another platform that's uh, becoming more important. Clearly, this has interesting design goals, right? Battery life is extremely important over here. Safety is extremely important. Security is very important. This is another platform that's Hopefully we will have, and hopefully we will be able to trust this platform as much as Mr. Bean trusts that platform in this particular movie, for example. But self-driving cars are a critical platform that may happen in the future. But again, to be able to trust this platform like this, how, do we, how should we design the computing systems? And that's going to be one of my fundamental questions uh, that I will talk about. This is a more realistic self-driving car. Uh, that is one of Google's self-driving cars. You can see that there's a huge computing platform that is in, embedded into the car. And probably it's consuming a lot of power, as you can see. This is another computing platform. This is a data center. And it's more general purpose. But you can see it looks clearly different. And this is another platform that looks similar to the data center. But it's completely different in the sense that this is a supercomputer. This is China's supercomputer. It's probably not the best anymore, but at the time I created these slides, it was the best uh, in the world. Uh, but as you can see, there are similarities, uh, but this is designed not for general purpose performance, but for highest performance in scientific calculations. And this is another platform. This is Google's tensor processing unit that Google, a, a traditionally software and services company, built its own hardware to accelerate machine learning workloads because they were constrained by the efficiency and performance and cost of the platforms they would buy uh, from somebody else. So they decided they would co-optimize their software together with this processor and platform so that they can execute their machine learning workloads extremely efficiently and fast at low cost. So they, they decided that that was a good tra uh, uh, trade-off uh, for them. This is another company that's traditionally not a hardware company. Uh, Tesla, as you can see, uh, they're also building their own computing platforms, uh, including chips. Uh, and they do it so that they can actually co-optimize their hardware and the software together 
so that they can optimize the hardware so that they can run their self-driving car software, the neural networks that detects pedestrians, for example, and many, many other things clearly. And clearly they have a redundancy elements, as you can see over here, to get better safety. This is another platform that's more recent. This was designed by a startup called Cerebras. It's a wafer scale platform. You can see that this has 1.2 trillion transistors. It's literally this big, basically. And it's much larger than the largest GPU over here. And this is designed mainly for accelerating machine learning, training, and inference, mainly training, actually, large training tasks. They figured out that large machine learning training tasks require lots of computation power, as well as memory, to be on the same chip. And how do you get that much computation and memory on the same chip? Basically, you build a huge wafer, as opposed to uh, cutting, uh, having a wafer and cutting it into smaller pieces. And this is what they released very recently in 2021. Actually, this was a couple of weeks ago, I think. Basically, they doubled, more than doubled the number of cores in their chip and more than doubled, well, almost doubled the tr transistors in their chip. So in, uh, basically, this shows that Moore's law is alive and it's still going well. We're able to put many, many transistors. We're still doubling the number of transistors on a chip, as you can see, within the course of two years or so, uh, which is not bad, I think. And this is still much, much larger than the largest GPU. And what Cerebras does is essentially hardware software co-design. They take algorithms to do machine learning training, and they basically map it through their compilers as well as so uh, other software to make sure that they execute very well on this huge chip. And this is not, these are just examples. There are many, many other machine learning chips that is important today, clearly. And there's many more to come, in my opinion. This is just one picture that looks at the machine learning landscape. And this is a relatively old, uh, maybe two years ago, I actually copied this uh, from this website. There are other platforms that are happening. This is the UpMems, uh, which is another startup uh, in uh, France. They're building these processing in memory chips, finally. What they have is inside the memory chips, they have processing capability. And I'm going to talk about this a lot, which we, this, this is something we have been working on for uh, about a decade uh, now. And finally, it's becoming real, as you can see. And we actually work with UpMem uh, to understand uh, how this can reduce the data movement in the systems and what kind of efficiency we get. And it's significant, basically. So if you're interested in this, uh, we recently released a paper on archive that talks about uh, an experimental analysis of this UpMem PIM engine. And it basically provides a lot of obs observations of processing in memory in a real commercial system uh, today. I'm I, I will talk about this processing memory uh, soon. And similar, uh, actually importantly, Samsung recently released uh, this uh, a paper as well as a press release, as you can see. They basically said they're also providing processing in memory architectures where they put, uh, simple computation capabilities inside their DRAM memory chips so that they can accelerate machine learning workloads. They target machine learning since it's very important today. And you can see you, this is going to be uh, similar to what I'm going to show you later, but basically they add simple instructions into their DRAM chips so that they can do matrix multiplications much faster and much more efficiently without moving the data between the processor and memory much. Okay, another uh, platform which is very different is genome sequencing. So these platforms also exist. You can sequence your own and other others' genomes uh, with this little device that you can plug into your cell phone. And uh, the downside of this today is you don't have processing capability over there. Uh, but of course, this could enable uh, a lot of innovation, which I'm going to talk about actually uh, in a little bit. Uh, it's going to be important. But we don't, uh, I don't have really platforms to do computation over here yet, but we're working on it. So uh, I hope these systems uh, prove uh, or show that the axiom that I uh, provide earlier is uh, true or important at least to consider. Basically to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance, we really want to take the expanded view of computer architecture and co-design algorithms all the way to devices across the hierarchy and specialize as much as possible within the design goals we have in mind. So with that in mind, the next question maybe becomes, what kind of a future do we want? And I want to talk, uh, keep this talk general. Uh, so uh, I think computer architecture is very general, of course. Uh, and I think a future where we rely on computing more and more requires computing to be much more reliable, secure, safe, and dependable at the same time. These are different concepts, clearly, but uh, they become similar if you have simple errors that essentially destroy your infrastructure. 
so build bridges are infrastructures that human beings have relied on for thousands of years, right? And they are clearly a critical infrastructure. If a bridge has a bit flip, an error, this may happen. And this, hap this is what happened to uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge close to Seattle, where I used to work. So this bridge doesn't exist anymore. They later built the bridge with two lanes so that they can have some redundancy. But this critical infrastructure collapsed. And as a result, you have reliability, safety, and security problems at the same time, right? Now, the critical infrastructure that we're building with computing is much worse than this critical infrastructure in the sense that it's everywhere. Bridges are not everywhere, clearly. But computing is going to be everywhere. And if our lives depend on that critical infrastructure, and if the critical infrastructure collapses like this because we have security issues, safety issues, or dependability issues at the wrong times, then we may have a problem. And this is another view of this bridge. And uh, so that's why I'm going to talk about safety, security, and reliability as the foremost thing. This is another example of this. These folks who are constructing New York after the World War are happy on this rod. But if this rod has a reliability problem, like a bit flip, like what we we're going to talk about, maybe uh, they're not going to be happy in one second later. Right? So I think of security is uh, about uh, preventing unforeseen consequences. And this is a very general definition of security that I introduce students to in the freshman class as well. And I think it's a very good way of thinking about security, uh, because I think in the future, we're going to use our computing platforms in unforeseen environments and unforeseen uh, uh, places, potentially, and unforeseen circumstances, essentially. So we should be able to provide security, safety, and reliability in, in those unforeseen, uh, but when we are subject to unforeseen consequences as well. And I think we have an advantage compared to bridges as computing, because computing is soft, right? We can actually reconfigure things if you design things correctly, whereas bridges are very hard to reconfigure. Uh, these are huge chunks of concrete, for example. It's very hard to reconfigure them, whereas computing, I think we have an advantage and we can potentially configure. So I believe a huge challenge and opportunity for computing platform design in the future is how to keep things reliable, secure, safe, dependable at the same time. Another big challenge is, do we want a world that looks like this, sustainable, energy efficient, beautiful, or a world there where we cannot breathe or we cannot live in? Hopefully, we would like a sustainable and energy efficient world that we can leave comfortably to our children. Uh, and I think that's going to be very important. And we're going to look at how to make computing systems fundamentally more energy efficient. Today, we're wasting a lot of efficiency because the computing systems are moving data all around the system at a micro scale, as well as a macro scale. And this is, I think, going to be a, a, a critical challenge, if not as important as the first one. And uh, we'll talk about that. On top of this, of course, we want high performance because we have many, many difficult problems to solve. And some of the problems are getting even more challenging today. Climate is a huge one. Uh, even though some people deny that climate issues don't exist, uh, scientists, I think, agree that they do exist. And this could be becoming much worse. Congestion is another example. Intelligence, understanding what's going on uh, at the very basics of intelligence uh, is going to be more important uh, for us. And this ties into psychology as well. And public health, as demonstrated recently uh, in the last more, uh, one plus year, is going to be even more important going into the future. And related to that, genome analysis, in my opinion, is going to be extremely important so that we can understand uh, what's going on in many of these medical health and intelligence kind of domains. And I think with genome analysis, we have the technologies that are on our side, meaning today we have genome analysis, genome sequencing technologies that are extremely low cost, and that can produce high throughput, low latency uh, uh, genome sequencing for us. As a result, uh, many uh, folks are sequencing many, many genomes. This graph ends at 2017 over here, but basically today, many, many genomes can be sequenced. It could be human genome, it could be any genome basically. And in fact, genome analysis has been uh, very useful in COVID-19 understanding as well. We have a lot more to do, of course, but. Because of these devices, we're at a point where we could understand the RNAs uh, of uh, various COVID-19 variants. So accelerating genome analysis, I think, is going to be even more important for many reasons. And if you're interested in this, this is an area that we work on heavily. And we recently wrote a survey paper that talks about uh, this. Uh, and I'm happy to share more if you're interested. And we work on also accelerators to this, uh, for this. For example, this is an acceleration framework that accelerates approximate string matching, which is at the core of genomic analysis, 
uh, as well as other analyses like text analysis. And if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it or you can read this paper. But as I said, devices are becoming smaller, higher throughput, lower power, but we need the computational power to actually improve the performance of genome analysis. And if you're interested, there are talks online that we put uh, that you can watch as well. I will not talk much about uh, genome analysis, but I think it's a great application uh, that uh, is an example. Uh, whose performance needs to be improved and whose efficiency needs to be improved so that we can do the genomic analyses locally in the device without moving the data around. Today, uh, we have these devices, these nanopore sequencing devices, for example, uh, that are extremely powerful, but uh, we need to move the data to a data center to process things. And that takes uh, both the processing as well as the data movement takes about uh, at least two or three days if you put a lot of computation power to it. We would like to be able to do these analyses within seconds, if, if not minutes, okay, uh, let's say minutes, so that we can give these devices to doctors and doctors can make critical decisions uh, about a patient's vulnerability to a particular disease or a patient's reaction, potential reaction to a particular treatment that they're going to apply. Uh, and these are life critical uh, decisions that cannot be delayed for days uh, or weeks for sure. So I think there's a lot of potential here and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it uh, later on, but not, uh, it will not be the focus of this talk. So that brings me also to personalization and privacy. And I, I think this is going to be more important uh, in addition to security. We want personalized medicine so that we can actually do the treatments in a very personalized manner, uh, develop a better health uh, for everyone in a much more personalized manner and also understand uh, the species and everything, uh, develop treatments by doing comparative genomics, metagenomics, so that we can really understand the differences uh, between different variants of things, for example. Uh, in this case, these are bacteria, for example, but you can think of COVID-19 today as well. So that's what's been en enabled by these devices. But today, basically, we have a huge computational bottleneck to enable this, but we, can, we need to be very personalized and private going into the future. And this is the fourth challenge and opportunity that I would like to pose. I'm not going to discuss this as much, but I think the future is going to be very personalized and private in the computing platforms. Some of these computing platforms we're going to wear, perhaps. Some of them are going to be with us all the time, and they have to be personalized and private. Health, medicine, spaces, devices, robotics. I think this is going to be an important issue. But I think personalization and privacy requires extreme energy efficiency and high performance also, because if you cannot process the data locally, you cannot easily keep it personalized and private as well. Okay, so this lecture is really about questioning what limits us in designing the best computing architectures for the future. Now that I've described some of what should the future look like, at least in my opinion, providing directions for fundamentally better designs and advocating principled approaches. So hopefully I'll give you examples of this. But I think one thing we should not forget is applications will always be increasingly demanding. As people dream, applications will come. And we've always considered this. In the 1980s, some folks said, we're not going to have better applications that need higher performance. So why should we design better processors? Clearly, we've come a long way, 40 years, and the computing power has become uh, amazingly larger compared to 1980s. So as applications push boundaries, computing platforms will become increasingly strained. And applications will always push boundaries because people are dreamers. So the key realization that I would like to convey at this point is that modern systems are essentially bottlenecked by data, storage of data and movement of data. And we're going to tackle, we're going to look at things from this perspective. So our focus is going to be on data storage systems, memory, as well as storage. But memory and storage are actually merge, merging today, going into the future with emerging non-volatile memory technologies. And for reasons of efficiency, we should really merge them. But I'm not going to talk about that aspect of memory. Uh, much. Essentially, main memory is a critical component of all computing systems we design today. Whatever system you design, you have to have some sort of working storage or working memory. And this system must scale in many dimensions in terms of its capacity, technology, efficiency, cost, and algorithms we use to manage it to maintain the performance growth and technology scaling benefits so that we can solve the problems that I mentioned earlier in a more, more efficient manner. And main memory is very fundamental, basically. It doesn't matter what kind of computing units you attach to it, processors and caches, FPGAs, GPUs, machine learning accelerators, Google's machine learning accelerators, Cerebras' wafer scale engine, for example. They're all bottlenecked by main memory in the end and bottlenecked by this 
uh, dichotomy between processing, computing, and memory. And we're going to uh, hopefully try to deconstruct that dichotomy today. So because the problem today is computing is bottlenecked by data. And I'm going to give you examples of this. Data is key for many real applications, AI, ML, genomics, databases. Important workloads are all data intensive. They require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data. And data is increasing. We can generate more data than we can process. I gave you the example of genomics, but AI, ML is very similar, basically. They, they're taking advantage of the increasing amounts of data so that we could at least try to learn from it. And these are some more traditional applications where memory is critical for performance. I'm sure many of you have dealt with this, either by programming it or using it. Memory is a bottleneck in these applications. These are some applications that we're actually using right now uh, in our systems. These are more on the mobile end, but right now we're doing video playback, video capture, uh, some inference, uh, baby browsing. And these are all bottleneck by memory also, and we're going to talk about that. Genome analysis increasingly is going to be strained by memory. It's already strained by memory because sequencing is not a problem, but computational bottleneck is a problem. And memory is what limits us uh, between the sequencing devices and scientific discovery and improvements in health and medicine. OK, I already mentioned this, basically. New sequencing technologies are actually there, uh, but they're bottlenecked by memory, essentially. These devices are bottlenecked by memory. OK. And uh, memory is also critical for energy. We're going to discuss this a little bit more. But basically, we did this work together with Google a few years ago, where we analyzed these important applications on mobile systems. And we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement across the memory hierarchy. So we're going to try to solve that problem. Okay, memory is also critical for reliability. This is some work that we've done with Facebook even more years ago, where we analyzed all of the memory errors in the data centers of Facebook. And they have a lot of data centers, a lot of memory. So this is statistically very, very significant data. And we found this very strong correlation between the chip density, memory chip density, employed in the server and the failure rate of the server. Essentially, as chip density increases, the failure rate increases as well. System reliability reduces, meaning this is because. As chip density increases, memory cells are closer to each other, and they're more vulnerable to reliability problems and noise. And they're also smaller. As a result, they're vulnerable to uh, vulnerability, uh, memory, uh, reliability problems and noise. And if you're interested, you can read the paper we wrote at the time as well. So rewording my realization, I would say that memory, modern systems are bottlenecked by memory today. And uh, if you're interested, actually, we've been working on memory for a long time. This is an early paper uh, that I delivered uh, to an industry workshop, international memory workshop, where we argued that there are many, many problems that we need to solve because memory is becoming much more of a bottleneck. And at that time, we didn't have a lot of evidence that memory is a huge security vulnerability as well. I'm going to talk about that first uh, as a real scaling issue, technology scaling issue that we are facing in all modern memory systems uh, that we use in our computing systems today. So with that, uh, let me jump into uh, the first key issue that I'm going to cover. How do we uh, think about fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures? I'm not going to have answers clearly at this point. Uh, I'm essentially going to give some problems and maybe uh, give some answers as well. There's some question, I think. The complexity of genome sequencing is MP complete. So a common approach is to look for a different software approach to find a lower complexity. Wouldn't this mean that the bottleneck is, not, is logical, not memory? OK, how would computer architecture uh, will be able to help? So yes, absolutely. So the, the, the issue is uh, it can be amply complete, depending on what you are trying to do. Uh, 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 but basically, people are devising algorithms. And in the end, the algorithms uh, get bottlenecked by memory. If you actually. Uh, we, we actually devised a lot of software algorithms to begin with uh, to improve genome sequence analysis. The first step, the mapping step uh, in genome analysis, as well as the assembly step, steps as well. Uh, but basically, yes, you should put all the effort into software to begin with. But in the end, uh, what you do is not enough. You're bottlenecked by the efficiency of your hardware. And your software, if you've done the right thing, it becomes bottlenecked by memory in the end because the amount of data that you're processing is huge. So your point is absolutely uh, correct that you have to optimize the software. But once you optimize the software, what else do you do? What else do you do? That's, that brings us to this algorithm architecture co-design. And that's essentially what people are do, doing in the uh, machine learning space also, right? In the machine learning, people have been optimizing software for a lot of the time. But the problem is, it's not enough. You have too much data. You're bottlenecked by memory. 
as a result, you need to really think about the underlying architecture in a complete different way and co-optimize the software and the architecture at the same time. So genome analysis happens to be uh, another workload, which is broader in my opinion, actually, than machine learning, uh, potentially. Uh, and it, has, it actually has many machine learning components in it as well. That's why I say it's broader because it's, it encompasses machine learning as well. Uh, but basically, genome analysis is a workload that has not been worked on as much. Uh, and we will, I believe, see uh, many more genome analysis architectures going into the future. In fact, some companies who are designing genome sequencing machines, Illumina, for example, uh, more recently, uh, last year, started putting FPGAs, field pro programmable gate arrays, in their, uh, uh, in their sequencing machines so that they can do some filtering early because they also find that that's a bottleneck uh, to begin with. Okay, uh, so let me jump into security, reliability, and safety. Uh, and I will give an example from this famous American psychologist, who's Abraham Maslow, who dedicated his life to understanding why human beings do the things they do. And he basically wrote books and papers, early paper being in 1943, uh, to, try, to try to develop a theory for human motivation. And he's more famous for what I'm going to show next, which is really this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has a lot of impact clearly in many fields, politics, economics, uh, psychology, et cetera, sociology. And basically, uh, he developed the theory that you have to have your basic needs satisfied first so that you can think about very high level needs like self-actualization and self-fulfillment, achieving your potential. If your safety and security are threatened, you cannot, you're not in a situation where you can really talk think about self-actualization. And clearly we can empathize with it. It's absolutely true. That's why I think reliability and security are extremely important. We have to satisfy that for our systems going into the future as well, just like we have to satisfy it for ourselves as human beings. And that brings me to the picture of this critical infrastructure that I already told you the story about. If you, have, if you keep having bit flips in our computing infrastructure like this, we, how, how are we going to be able to trust our self-driving cars to not make the right decision, uh, right decisions, uh, to not make the wrong decisions, right? And this is another example. That's why I believe security is so important and it's, it should be about preventing unforeseen consequences. Now, the big problem in my opinion is that we do not seem to have design principles for guaranteeing reliability, security, and safety. I just did not put safety over here, but you can keep adding it uh, to every time I say reliability and or security. And I think we, we need to develop these principles somehow. Certainly in hardware, we don't have it. Uh, and we, I think we will need to do that. So uh, let me give you a story about this in terms of memory. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we did the study with Facebook and as memory scales to smaller technology nodes, as cells become smaller and as they become closer to each other uh, with technology not scaling, it becomes unreliable and it affects our systems and server failure rate increases as you can see over here. And this is a function of the DEM scaling problem. So I'm going to go a little bit into more depth, talk about the circuit you may have seen. This is really the basic building block of the memory systems that we have in all of our devices, DRAM, dynamic random access memory. It stores charge in this capacitor, it's charge-based memory. And you need to have some access transistor, bit line and sense amplifier, essentially logic around the capacitor so that you can read the data that's stored in the capacitor reliably. So for this to work, both the storage device, capacitor must work reliably, and the access device, access transistor, and everything else around it must work. Capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. Access transistor must be large enough for long data retention time. And as you reduce the size of it so that you can get higher capacity and better energy potentially, it becomes more vulnerable, meaning reliability characteristics reduce, and it becomes more vulnerable to noise, system noise. So we've been building a lot of small-scale infrastructure to understand such issues. These are some early FPGA boards that we developed. Uh, this is uh, circa 2011, for example. And we have FPGA boards to test memory automatically. Uh, and you can take a look at some of these papers. I'm going to mention some of them. And we basically built this infrastructure to, to test memory and understand such scaling reliability problems. We also looked at a lot of performance problems, but I'm not going to talk about them. I'm mainly going to focus on reliability and security. And we recently released this as open source to the community. If people are interested in testing memory, they can download our open source code, uh, which is actually C, which is a nice C++ interface. So it's flexible, open source, and we keep maintaining it. A lot of folks in academia and industry have been using it, writing uh, papers uh, about it as well. 
and we've been supporting them. So uh, if, you, if you need help, please let us know. And you can read the paper that introduced the open source software. Okay, so while we were doing these studies, we found out uh, something very interesting together with Intel. Uh, and we published this work in 2014, but we've been doing the experiment since 2012. And the discovery is that one can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. And this is now known as the DRAM row hammer problem. Clearly, this should not happen, right? You should not be able to induce errors in a memory chip in locations that you're not accessing. Clearly, if you're accessing and writing to a location, you should be able to change it predictably with the value that you input to memory. But locations that you're not accessing should not be affected. So it turns out row hammer is a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And people are writing articles that sound like this. The title is Forget Software, Now Hackers Are Exploiting Physics. And I like this because this is a very nice high-level description of what Rovehammer is really about. It's about physics in the end. And let me tell you what uh, it is, essentially. If you look at DRAM, it consists of rows of DRAM cells. I showed you earlier a DRAM cell. Imagine each row being eight kilobytes and imagine tens of thousands of rows in a chip. Basically, Whenever you want to access a cell in memory, you need to activate the row, apply high voltage to that row that it's called a word line. Uh, this is called an activate command to DRAM. This enables you to read from that row. And then if you want to, act if you want to access some other row, you apply low voltage to this uh, word line that you activated. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, it turns out in most DRAM, memory chips, adjacent, physically adjacent cells, some physically adjacent cells that are vulnerable to this effect get flipped. They go from zero to one or one to zero. And clearly this should not happen, right? Basically by hammering this row, by keeping it activating it many, many times before the cells get refreshed, you're causing errors that are not supposed to happen in locations that you should not really change at all because you're not even changing the hammer drop. You should not really be changing anything in memory by doing this. So we call these the victim rows. Uh, and clearly those victim rows may belong to your own process. It could belong to the operating system. It could belong to some other random application. So you're corrupting data or you're corrupting some important data structures that may be preventing some other, uh, preventing you from accessing some important locations. They may be permission bits, for example, in the operating system. So that's why this is a security problem. And we showed that more than 80% of the chips that we tested actually were vulnerable to this problem. And this is a scaling problem because chips that are older did not have this problem, but chips that uh, the first appearance was in 2010 and chips, all of the chips that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 were vulnerable to this effect. Basically cells became too close to each other at, this, at some point so that you could actually induce enough hammering before the cells get refreshed so that you could actually deplete the charge in some vulnerable cells. That's why it's a scaling effect, technology scaling effects, because over the years, cells are becoming smaller. And as a result, they store less charge and they become closer to each other as well. So I've given you, I think, an idea of why is this happening, but very quickly, DRAM cells are too close to each other. As a result, they're not electrically isolated from each other. Access to one cell affects the value nearby cells due to electrical interference between the cells, as well as the wires used for accessing the cells. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling interference clearly. Uh, and it happens in real wires as well, right? If your two wires are too close to each other and you don't have electrical isolation, you will have interference between them. Uh, an example, an intuitive example, there are multiple effects that go into it actually. It's very complicated because modern DRAM is very, very small. But when you activate, apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well. And vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge. And if, the, if you do this hammering enough times, charge in such cells gets drained. Of course, if you can fit enough hammerings within a refresh interval. Okay, but basically the simple circuit level failure mechanism has huge implications on upper layers of the transformation hierarchy. And because it gets, these, these uh, errors get exposed to users, uh, programmers, as well as users of the system. Why? Because a user level program can actually induce these errors. And when we wrote the paper, we released this simple code, x86 code, which essentially induces row hammers by selecting row hammer by selecting X and Y appropriately and hammering essentially X and Y. And if the chip is vulnerable, you will get errors in some cells. And we showed that uh, 
Intel and AMD chips are vulnerable at the time. There's nothing special about Intel and AMD. Uh, all of the other uh, processors that enable you to do this hammering enough times uh, before the cells get refreshed actually lead to this problem. And later people show that all of the other um, uh, chips that are out in the field are actually vulnerable. And this is a real reliability and security issue. And it's a security issue because one can take over an otherwise secure system. And when we first write, wrote the paper, we said that you could use this effect to crash your system, uh, do denial of service, but even worse, someone can take over or hijack your system by intelligently exploit these bit flips. At the time we wrote the paper, we said that uh, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. And this is still fundamental, I think. And we said that someone can hijack your computer and these good folks from Google Project Zero uh, 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 read our paper and they basically showed essentially what we predicted. They did beautiful security engineering to exploit those bit flips. Uh, and this, is, uh, this slide is directly copied and pasted uh, from this Black Hat presentation, as well as the blog post that Mark Seaborn and Thomas Dulien uh, put up. Uh, they basically said they can replicate the problem and they built two attacks, essentially. And one attack is very interesting because they were able to exploit these raw hammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges on a Linux system when you run a simple application as a user level process. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but basically it's a beautiful security engineering. And I recommend people to read this blog post and watch the Black Hat presentation. Uh, they basically were able to induce bit flips using row hammer in page table entries of the process. And they were able to flip the permission bits that uh, enabled access to the process on page table. So the process was able to, user level process was able to gain write access to its own page table. And once you're able to write to your own page table, you can, say, you can change any permission to any memory location in the system and it can take over uh, any system essentially, uh, that system. So this became uh, known as the row hammer vulnerability and people started drawing pictures like this. I like this hacker's explanation uh, analogy. It's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations opened the door you were after. And I think this is nice. But later bu people built a lot of attacks. So these, uh, I'm going to talk about a few of them just to give you an idea of what a simple bit flip actually enables people to do. And this is, I think, a bit scary because these bit flips may happen in our self-driving cars, as I said, but anything that we rely our lives on. Uh, if a bit flip happens in a recommendation system that uh, guides the doctor to give you a particular drug, and uh, if it channels the doctor to make a wrong decision, it could be life critical also, right? And there are many, many scenarios that you can see uh, that these bit flips uh, may not necessarily uh, enable someone to take over the system, but it may corrupt the data in the wrong time at the wrong place and lead to a huge uh, problem, a safety problem, if not a security problem, right? But these folks actually showed that you could actually remotely gain access to systems of website visitors using Rowhammer. These folks showed that you can gain control of a smartphone deterministically. I'm not going to go into the details, but these are beautiful papers actually. And you can download this app, I think. Uh, other folks show that you could do these attacks, Rowhammer attacks much faster with GPUs so that you can actually hammer the memory much faster. Other folks show that you could do this through the remote direct memory access interface so that you can actually take over a remote computer. And these folks actually did the same thing concurrently. Uh, these folks show that even if a system may be protected so that you cannot uh, take, over, take it over, you can leak private data uh, using Rowhammer. And more recently, these folks show that uh, even if you may have a great neural network that's very, very accurate, if someone somehow does rope hammer attacks on that neural network, you can essentially uh, get to an accuracy level that's really bad. Basically, I think of this as we have a great self-driving car that's guided by neural networks with very high accuracy, more than 90%. I think we need to achieve more than 99%, but even 90% is, okay, maybe acceptable with some redundancy. But if someone does a rope hammer attack on that system, which is not hard to do at the user level, the accuracy immediately tanks. So then the question remains, how do we actually fix, how can, how can we actually trust our systems when we have this sort of uh, uh, problems that are essentially threatening our safety and security? And there are other works that I'm not going to talk about. And this is a joke on the internet. Maybe this is a 
potential fix to the problem, but it could, uh, it could be a potential solution also. Okay, so how do we fix the problem? I'm not going to go into details of exactly how we fix the problem, but if the memory chips are out in the field, you don't have much choice. Today, we don't have programmable or patchable memory controllers. Not in intelligent memory controllers don't exist. I'm going to argue for them. But basically, we increase the refresh rates. Apple increased the refresh rate significantly uh, because that's what you can do in existing systems with a software patch. And they were nice enough to actually uh, uh, reference our paper uh, as the original source uh, of why they did this. Uh, so it's nice when industry does this. I think more and more industry folks should do it, but uh, unfortunately, they don't. Uh, OK, so I think uh, we need a more principled direction into the future. We cannot just keep increasing the refresh rates, because refresh rate increase actually leads to a lot of performance and energy issues, because you keep refreshing the memory more often to solve this problem. And that's a bad idea. That increases the energy uh, consumption and performance loss. So we really should rethink our systems to design some fundamentally secure computing architectures. We should be able to predict and prevent such safety issues. I don't have all the answers, but I can give you some directions. And one direction that we followed uh, in our solution is, was probabilistic adjacent row activation. And the idea is very simple. After closing a row, memory activates, me memory controller probabilistically activates just the neighbors of the row with very low probability. And that's the idea over here. You don't refresh the entire memory more often, but memory control is intelligent. It knows uh, at what uh, fraction you will get errors and basically sets a fraction such that it would activate the, just the adjacent neighbor rows uh, frequently enough so that it doesn't lead to bit flips. And this leads to a great reliability guarantee. And you can read the paper. If you're paranoid, you can, set, uh, you can change the value of P so that you can increase the protection. Now, uh, this is, a, in, my, in my opinion, a good solution because uh, it's a memory controller-based solution. Uh, it has low power and low performance overhead and stateless. Uh, it's an effective and low overhead solution. And it could be implemented inside the DRAM chip as well as memory controller, but we argue that it's better to implement in the memory controller, but I'm not going to go into the details of it. Now, the good news is, well, good news and bad news. Good news is it was implemented by Intel memory controllers uh, as early as 2016 or so. Uh, and you can see that in the BIOS, it's not, it's not exactly how we envisioned it, but it's a version of it, variant of it. In the BIOS, the user can pick their row hammer solution, either 2x refresh, probably a bad idea, or hardware row hammer protection, which they can later configure as uh, the probabilistic activation probability of row uh, adjacent rows. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, and Intel doesn't disclose exact details. We did a lot of testing to understand this, but it's very similar to what we proposed. This was inside Intel BIOSes, except we, uh, after Intel released it, the DM manufacturers said, we actually have a solution, and they actually put the solution in their chips and trust us, uh, it's secure. I'm going to tell a story about that. It turned out it's not secure. So we're back to square one in Rovehammer, but uh, let's, uh, let's leave it to the next few slides. So if you're interested in Rovehammer, there's actually a lot more interesting things to do. This is our original paper, and uh, we wrote more papers about it. And this is a recent retrospective that we were invited to write in 2019, but we did more work on it, and others did more work on it in 2020, actually. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, next. Okay, so there's one question. With the very high frequency of today's CPUs, could accessing the same file many, many times cause a similar fault? Absolutely, yes. It can, actually, because files are memory mapped today. And in fact, if you go and look at Google Project Zero's blog post and Black Hat paper, they do file mapping into memory so that they could induce these errors. And I'd recommend looking at that blog post. Very good question. Uh, okay, so I would recommend uh, this retrospective covers a lot of research actually that was done on Rovehammer. I think hundreds of papers. If you're interested in it, you can take a look at it. And it spans hardware and software all the way into the devices. But let me talk about what we found in 2020. We didn't stop working on Rovehammer, especially we intensified our research after DRAM manufacturers said we solved the problem, trust us. And we did a lot of studies. And this is one study that was published in ISCA last year. Basically, the key takeaway is newer DRAM chips are much more vulnerable to Rovehammer, and existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective. You can read the paper for more detail, but today uh, uh, you can actually induce these bit flips only after 4,800 hammers, which is within the course of actually uh, microseconds, uh, which is really fast. OK. We also did this work where we actually uh, questioned uh, DRAM manufacturers' uh, solutions. We tried to understand what they implemented in real DRAM chips. We reverse engineered it partially. 
And we were able to circumvent the protections they, they, were, they put in their chips. And we basically showed that what they claim to be secure is not secure. Essentially, you could actually induce Rovehammer attacks on chips that are advertised as Rovehammer free. Uh, and you can take a look at this paper for more detail. And these two papers in conjunction caused a stir in industry. Industry is right now examining Rovehammer again so that we can provide better solutions, hopefully. It should have been done earlier, in my opinion, but uh, it took us, uh, it had to take us uh, to do multiple of these works uh, to do it. And basically, the, we call this trespass because TRR is the solution that's implemented in uh, in, uh, by DR manufacturers. And basically, we were able to overflow the tables that they had internally. Uh, and they were able to, they were recording the frequently activated rows in these tables, but these tables were uh, so, uh, were not sized appropriately, and they were not secure, basically. They were not security, secure proof. As a result, we were able to uh, circumvent those tables. So Roheml is still an open problem. And I think security by obscurity, which was the route taken by manufacturers, is likely not a good solution. Uh, so we really need to think about solutions. Uh, so this is another paper that we wrote with Microsoft Research to understand whether we could qualify a DRAM chip as completely Roheml free. Uh, by doing enough testing or intelligent testing. And our answer was basically no in this paper because it's very, very difficult to problem to solve by testing. But we have other solutions. I'm not going to go into the details. We developed this block hammer solution uh, to actually uh, solve the problem. And I'm not going to go into the detail, uh, but I think this is an interesting solution that should be considered that is scalable uh, going into the future. So if you're interested, there are a lot more detailed uh, lectures uh, on Rove Hammer. Uh, I don't have more time to talk about it, but uh, this could be a lecture by itself. And you can take a look at this particular lecture if you're interested. Uh, so there is some question. Maybe I'll take it. Does this Rovehammer issue affect uh, GPUs VRAM? Yes, I, I, exactly. So it does affect GPUs also, uh, even though uh, I'm not sure if there are any studies that have actually been published related to it. And I'm not sure if it's really publishable uh, at that point. Uh, OK, one more question. All our problems is more than less related to getting more and more performance. And bottleneck is memory and interconnect to increase performance. We need to specify and design memory controls for domain-specific cases. But past shows that this does not work because of commercially no benefits. OK, what's the options? So I think we need to take a different approach, basically. We need to have a more flexible and intelligent memory controller that we can program going into the future. And we can discuss it. But OK, let me uh, pull back a little bit. So basically, DRAM is clearly becoming less reliable and more vulnerable. It's not, uh, and due to difficulties in DRAM scaling, other problems may also appear, or they may be going unnoticed. Some errors may already be slipping into the field. Clearly, read disturb errors like Rohammer are examples. Retention errors may be just getting into the field also. Read errors, write errors, and who knows what else. All of these errors can also pose security vulnerabilities, and somebody may be exploiting them in our systems. OK. Uh, so other memory technologies are also vulnerable. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but uh, flash memory, emerging memory technologies, all of them have similar problems. DRAM is special because it gets directly exposed to the programming language. Our data structures are in DRAM. Flash memory is not as much so. But some emerging memory technologies are slated to have uh, our data structures directly exposed in them as well. So they're going to be... Uh, vulnerable to many different types of effects. So we really need to think the security of our memory. So as I said, I don't have answers to everything clearly, but I think I can propose a methodology to keep memory more secure, reliable, and safe. And I think we have a three-step methodology that uh, could be viable. Essentially, we should understand, architect, and design and test. Understanding requires methodologies for failure modeling and discovery based on real device data like we have been doing and like some others have started doing. Architecting requires good partitioning across duties across the stack. We should not really be saying everything should be in the memory or everything should be in the memory controller or everything should be in hardware or software. We really should rethink co-architecting of system and memory. And designing and testing is important because in the end, we really want principal design, automation, and testing methods that can take into account security vulnerabilities, which essentially these methods don't exist today to my knowledge. So, and we want high coverage and good interaction with system reliability methods. So that's why we've been building uh, these infrastructures to understand. And actually, we have infrastructures for flash memory if people are interested. And we recently were invited to write a paper uh, about the work that we have done on flash memory reliability. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. It's also fascinating, uh, clearly, but I don't have time to talk about it. 
I think there are two other solution directions that are interesting, new technologies, somehow replacing uh, or more likely augmenting uh, problematic technologies with different technologies. I think that's good, but the difficulty is like non-volatile memories are examples, phase change memory. The difficulty is all memory technologies have problems. There's no perfect memory technology. Uh, embracing unreliability could be interesting for sure if we can afford to do it. If we can design memories with different reliability guarantees and store data intelligently across them by, doing a, by taking a hardware software co-design approach, I think that's good, that could potentially work. But that requires a lot of co-design across the hierarchy as well. So I think we really need to rethink algorithms and devices for both of these over here. So, uh, so, Professor Onar, this is outstanding, but back to the previous slide that you just had, uh, aren't most security attacks start at the algorithmic level or, or at the software level and mm -hmm. target something at the device level or at the physical layer to cause failure? Like your example of DRAM, it starts at some software that tries to access a certain room repetitively and then cause a failure, which is physical at the level of coupling between rows and, and devices and so on. So my question is, most of these attacks are as such, right? They start at the software layer and target a device layer, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, yes, absolutely, Ab absolutely, that's correct. Uh, but uh, if we can, for example, the second solution over here, uh, if we can uh, take our security critical data and put it into a very reliable mm -hmm. memory, that's high cost. Yeah. Then uh, you, can, you can prevent those software attacks because the software will not be able to induce it on the highly reliable, but of course, high cost device. Yeah. Yeah. Because I heard also of some security attacks that target thermal issues, you know, that they, mm -hmm. uh, it's just some programs that tries to cause some hotspots and mm -hmm. that's very physical that causes failures. And I don't know what are other examples, but mm -hmm. if this is a trend that justifies very well your, your ideology of working on uh, algorithms all the way to devices, it's the only way to handle security. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. I think that's a great example. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. for giving it, actually. I agree that those thermal attacks require uh, also rethinking algorithms to devices because it's very hard to prevent otherwise. Yes. Yeah. And other side channels also, I think, uh, that have been discovered recently, like Meltdown and Spectre, microarchitectural side channels as well, in my opinion, mm -hmm. require thinking like this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, very quickly, this uh, embracing unreliability while we're at it. Uh, applications have different tolerance to errors. Data have different tolerance to errors. And the idea here is basically figure out what is vulnerable and what is tolerant or what is security critical and what is not security critical and map it to different devices. Reliable memory will not have hammer like issues. Low cost memory will have hammer like issues, but maybe you map a lot of your data is tolerant in machine learning workloads, for example. Some data is not as important as others. And, but this requires, of course, your identification of tolerant data and vulnerable data. So that's why it's across the stack. And it involves a programmer as well, actually. We introduced this idea of heterogeneous reliability memory in DSN in 2014. And we did some work uh, together with Microsoft where we showed that you could actually get good reliability while also reducing the hardware cost. But again, as I said, this is across the stack, applications need to specify the error tolerance of different data or security vulnerabilities or security criticality. And then you need to map the application to the heterogeneous reliability memory system to hardware software cooperation. And of course, you need to design the devices to have different sorts of reliability. So if you're interested, again, uh, there's more in this paper. Uh, but that brings me to the end of the first challenge, which is, oh, sorry about that how to design fundamentally secure, reliable, safe computing architectures. And I think this is a huge challenge and opportunity. And I think uh, issues like Robehammer uh, and memory related issues require intelligent controllers to solve the problem that are controlled by higher levels of software stack like algorithms. And I think infield patchability uh, comes with intelligent memory and that can avoid many failures. Okay, uh, maybe we should move quickly into the next topic. Uh, it's good that people are asking questions and feel free to ask more. Now, let me switch to a different direction that is as important in my opinion, and I've argued that it's going to be more important actually. How do you design uh, fundamentally energy efficient architectures? And that in my opinion means data centric, memory centric architectures where we do not move the data. And I've, I'm uh, going to use Maslow's hierarchy back again. 
uh, I kind of abused Maslow's hierarchy earlier. I said security and reliability and safety are the most important. But if you look at the hierarchy, that's at the second level over here, right? What we really need is energy to live with first, food, water, warmth, and rest. And I think that's true for computers also. Maybe you could argue that if you don't have energy, maybe you don't even care about security and safety because uh, the computing system cannot be powered up anyways. And I think this cuts to the heart of what we're going to tackle in the next 10 to 20 years, which is sustainability and climate. Do we want this or a world we cannot live in? And I will argue that we want certainly energy efficiency and sustainability, but we also want high performance so that we can actually solve the problems. The question is, of course, how do we get best of all of these worlds? I think we have a chance to tackle the problem at uh, the biggest problematic layer. Day day access today is a major performance and energy bottleneck at the same time. And our current design principles cause great energy waste as well as great performance loss because we're moving data all around the system. Memory and processor are as far away from each other at the micro scale. And at the macro scale, things that are getting processed at places that are far away from where data is produced. So basically, processing of data is performed far away from the data. And we should perhaps fix that. So if you look at a computing system, fundamentally, it consists of computation, communication, and storage elements. And for decades, we've heavily optimized the processor. Today, it's accelerators also. But we're very processor-centric. All data is processed in the processor at great system cost. Processor is heavily optimized. Everything else cannot do anything to the data. Basically, they're very unoptimized. Because as a result, we have to move everything to the computing unit first so that we can process it. Whereas if you look at memory and storage units, communication units, a lot of data is in there. And if we can just process the data in place, we could eliminate a lot of the energy inefficiency uh, due to data movements. And we know that memory is a huge bottleneck. This is very well known. This is actually a quote from Dick Seitz, who was the chief architect of alpha processors in the 1990s. After his team designed a flagship processor, which was the fastest of its time, he basically wrote a one-page paper at Microprocessor Report saying that we designed this chip to finish four instructions every cycle, every clock cycle, but the chip is finishing one instruction every 4.7 clock cycles. It's operating 1 18th of its bandwidth, basically, uh, peak capability. Why it's waiting for data from memory? And he basically uh, says, I expect that over the coming decade, memory system design will be the only important design issue for microprocessors. So clearly, memory is a huge performance bottleneck, uh, limiting our efficiency and performance at the same time. This is data from my own PhD thesis, where we showed essentially the same thing together with Intel, looking at the workloads that Intel used to design its computers with. Basically, most of the time, the processor is waiting for data. And if you're interested, you can look at it, uh, the paper that we wrote a long time ago. And uh, maybe you don't believe me or uh, Dick Seitz, since a lot of people believe Google for some reason today. Google published a paper, this beautiful paper, about six years ago. And they basically showed essentially the same thing at a cutting edge processor that they employ in their data centers, executing any workload that is executing on their data center is waiting for memory to supply the data most of the time. So it's basically bottleneck by memory. So basically we, have, we are experiencing the parallels of processor centric design. We have gross steam balance system because processing is done only in one place. Everything else just stores and moves data and this energy inefficient, low performance and complex. And to overcome this, we actually make our systems more complicated the processor and the accelerators become bloated. We add a lot of mechanisms to tolerate data access from memory, multi-threading, out-of-order execution, many, many levels of caching hierarchies and software and hardware, et cetera, prefetching. And as a result, this becomes energy efficient, low performance and complex. And opportunity cost actually reduces as well, increases as well. And when these mechanisms don't work, actually, we lose a lot of efficiency even more on top of the energy inefficiency of moving data around. So as a result, we have a picture that looks like this. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data. If you look at a single node system today, more than 90, 95% of the hardware real estate is not in the computation units. It's really in things that move and store data. Interconnects, caches, main memory, storage, essentially. And we call these computing systems or processors, but most of the hardware is not really in computing. It's really in storing and moving data. So let's look at the system strands. Uh, clearly, data access is a major bottleneck, as I showed you earlier. Energy consumption is a key limiter. And data movement on top of this and it, uh, com dominates compute in terms of energy. I'm going to give you some results related to this. I'm going to borrow some slides from Bill Daly, who's the chief scientist of NVIDIA, six years ago. These numbers have changed. 
but the relative things remain. Essentially, a 64-bit double precision floating point operation, a complicated computation is 20 picojoules, and memory access is 16 nanojoules. That's 800x energy difference. OK, so if you look at technologies today, it's about two to three orders of magnitude between 100x to 1,000x today. So essentially, to just to move an element uh, from DRAM, mem main memory, to the processor so that you can do a very simple operation on it, simple in terms of energy, we're consuming two to three orders of magnitude more energy. This begs the question, is that the right thing to do? Especially when the caches don't work and you don't exploit locality very well in applications. And in many applications, actually, cannot exploit locality really, really well today. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples of this. Uh, and basically, does, does it really make sense to move two operands from DRAM to the chip just to do this very simple operation and write back one operand to DRAM as a result, consume three times two orders to three orders of magnitude energy? And I will argue that it doesn't. And if you're interested, there are more references in the slide that shows essentially the same thing, two to three orders of magnitude. As a result, we have a picture that looks like this. More than 60% of the entire system energy on real workloads is spent on data movement. So I will argue that we do not want to move data. We need a paradigm shift, rethinking of computation so that we can enable computation with minimal data movement, compute where it makes sense, where data really resides, all while it's moving, and make computing architectures much more data-centric. So, so I'm arguing that we should really do this everywhere where data resides. Caches, main memory, storage, disks, tape, uh, devices where we generate the data, like genomic uh, sequencing devices. I think it makes sense. But I'm going to examine the special case of main memory right now, because many applications actually, main memory is huge also, and many applications are designed to fit memory today. Databases are examples, graph processing and media processing are examples. And at the high level, we would like to be able to query memory, ask questions. Memory, can you do this computation for me? And memory does the computation and provides the results. It looks nice, but there are many questions to get there. How do we design the memory and the controllers? How do we design the processor chip and in-memory units? How do we design the software and hardware interfaces to enable this? System software, compilers, and languages? Algorithms and even theoretical foundations of computing, basically. How do we rethink those? And I think this is, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, the answers of all of these questions. I'm going to give you some spot examples. But basically, this is another example of uh, co-design from all the way from algorithms to device and even theoretical foundations of computing. So if some, some of you have taken potentially computer science classes where you counted operations. So we uh, quantify the complexity of our algorithms today by the big O notation or big theta notation, which is essentially counting operations, right? But maybe that's not what's important in terms of energy and performance because we're bottleneck by memory. Maybe we should really be developing a theory of computing that's more data-centric. In fact, that theory of counting operations was developed because of a, with a processor-centric mindset and paradigm. So I think this cuts all the way to the theoretical uh, uh, foundations of computing. OK, let me uh, look at uh, uh, some questions quickly, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Could the focus on development of ultra-high-speed energy-efficient SERDI systems be the solution? So certainly, I think interconnects play a big role also. We should perhaps really think about interconnects as well. But in the end, if you don't use the interconnect, it's even better. The, the more, the less interconnect you use, uh, the better for energy. But certainly, yes, energy-efficient interconnects is a great idea. Another question is, how is this paradigm shift different today uh, from when it was studied in the late 1990s with memory on processor and processor on memory studies? That's an excellent question also. If this was a processing in memory talk, I would actually uh, go into it more. So today, I think we're at a much more constrained point. It, actually, the, the first idea of processing in memory was proposed in the late 1960s, uh, uh, a logic in memory paper, a logic, logic in memory computer paper by Harold Stone in 1970. Based on the research he's done between 1965 to 1970, is a seminal paper. And then the idea was examined many, many times today, until today. Uh, but basically, uh, we were never at a point where we had the technology scaling issues we had with memory today. And we were never at a point where we were so much constrained by the energy of data movement. And we were never at a point where data uh, was so large that we were not able to deal with it as well today. So I think we're basically being pushed from technology as well as applications and systems. And in a sense, we have nowhere to escape, in my opinion. Uh, but that's an excellent question, certainly. Why, why should uh, 
uh, really, it, why should it really take off today? And I think the other example of this today is, today we have actually real commercial startups, as well as big companies that are looking into uh, pull, uh, putting products that can do processing in memory. That's a reflection, in my opinion, of uh, the technology scaling issues, as well as the system scaling issues and energy issues that we have today. Okay, do we still not need to move the result in a similar uh, design similar to this? Uh, so yes, but hopefully the result is small. Uh, the data that you're operating on can be huge. You may be summarizing the data, for example, and hopefully your result is small. And maybe there is a system where you don't move the result also, which is not depicted uh, in my cartoon over here. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me uh, go into it. The next question will be answered, hopefully, uh, with my examples. So let me go give you some examples of this. Clearly, I'm not going to solve the entire problem and give you answers to all the questions. And I don't have the answers to all the questions. And hopefully, the research community and hopefully some of the people who are listening to those, this talk uh, may provide some research that can solve some of these questions. Uh, I'm going to give you pointers. But I'm going to give you some hope, hopefully. And I'm going to give you an example uh, from starting simple. And maybe we should rethink some of the simple primitives and how do we execute them. Data copy and initialization is one example. We do a lot of data copying and initialization. Imagine initializing a one terabyte database that we have. Does it really make sense to write zeros to everywhere going through the CPU? Does it really make sense to copy data through the CPU today? In fact, Google, in the work that I mentioned earlier, they basically show that just two function calls that do data copying, mem move and mem copy, uh, account for 5% of the execution cycles in Google's data center workload. That's a lot for just two function calls. And I'd recommend taking a look at their paper. So how do we do the data copying today? If you want to copy a small page, four kilobyte page to a destination page, today, basically, you have to go through the CPU, at least the memory controller, which is on the CPU chip. Basically, this requires uh, the data to be copied byte by byte into the L1 cache and then written to the destination page and the destination page written back to memory byte by byte. So it's a lot of data movement, basically. High latency, clearly, because you have to go through the memory bus. High bandwidth utilization, because you have to go through the memory bus, which is a a very high bandwidth constrained resource today. It causes cache pollution, but you could eliminate that by doing this through the direct memory access engine, through the memory controller. And unwanted data moment, because you may be initializing some pages, maybe not copying, uh, but maybe copying also a lot of pages. And you may not be reusing uh, the data that you're writing, essentially, anytime soon. So basically, a small page copy, even a small page copy, four kilobytes, by just going through the memory controller, not even disturbing the caches, takes about 1,000 nanoseconds in today's technologies and 3.6 microjoules. The question is, can we do better? So if you were data-centric, maybe we wouldn't go through the CPU. Well, I don't think we should go through the CPU. Why not just do it inside the memory when it makes sense to do so? If you don't have good locality, for example, in the destination page, just do it inside the memory. Right? So this is low latency. I'm going to show you an example. Low bandwidth utilization. You don't consume any data bus bandwidth. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today as well. And no unwanted data move. So I'm going to show you an example that in the best case reduces this 1,000 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. And the idea is very simple. It can be applied to any memory chip that, I, uh, that we have thought about so far. But DRAM is uh, one where we can apply it to nicely and easily. We call it row clone. It's in DRAM row copy. If the source and destination rows are in the same subarray, the idea is basically to activate the source row, which brings the data very little to, uh, with very little movement to the row buffer, which is essentially the sense amplifiers in DM. And then the next step is to activate the destination row quickly so that the data and the row buffer gets copied into the destination row. So this happens because of charge sharing principles and the strength of the sense amplifiers in DM. By doing two consecutive activates with almost negligible hardware cost, you can actually do it. In fact, uh, some recent, uh, a recent study that was published about two years ago showed that you could do it in off-the-shelf DRAM chips by violating the timing parameters in DRAM, even if DRAM is not designed to do this. But of course, to do it reliably and uh, by according to the specification, you can design the DRAM very slight changes to enable this. As a result, you gain more than or an order of magnitude latency improvement and a 74x energy reduction in this four kilobyte uh, uh, page copy. Uh, ignore the other bars over here. We improved those other bars. I'm, not, I'm going to actually flash a slide that talks about that, but I'm not going to talk about it. But basically, I think these improvements are significant. And you can read the paper for more detail and application evaluation. You can maybe ask questions, OK, can you do copies inside other parts of a DRAM chip? And the answer is yes. 
Can you do copies at small granularities? And the answer is yes. Can you do better copies if you actually exploit 3D stacking, for example? And the answer is yes. I'm going to talk about the last question in a little bit. But for the other questions, I'll refer you to uh, the other papers. But before I go into the next step, the thinking is different right now. Basically, we're thinking of memory as an accelerator of copy and initialization in this case, but we're going to do more. Why not? Basically, all of the accelerators that we're designing, and we're designing many, many accelerators, they're all bottlenecked by the memory bus. Why not do some things on the memory side that we can accelerate some special operations with based on what the memory is extremely good at? And that's the idea. The specialized computation capability or specialized accelerator on the memory side is similar to a conventional accelerator, but specialized in terms of what it can do based on the characteristics of the memory and maybe based on the characteristics of the application that's using the memory. OK, so very quickly, we can also support in-memory bulk bitwise operations in DM and or not majority. And on top of this, you can actually build full applications, essentially. I'm going to give you the basic idea, but not go into a lot of detail. Basically, we can use the analog computation capability of DM. And the key idea is activating multiple rows concurrently performs computation. And this leads to 30 to 60x performance energy improvement in these fundamental bitwise operations. And you can read the paper for more detail. What I'm not going to talk about is new memory technologies. They can, in my opinion, enable even more opportunities because uh, you can operate on data with minimal movement because these are non-volatile. DM is fundamentally volatile and reads are destructive. As a result, you need to move the data at least a little bit to do the operation. And let me give you an example. This is in DM and an OR, or majority function. Basically, imagine three DM rows, ABC. I'm, I'm depicting only one cell in each row, but imagine eight kilobytes of these cells so that you can do eight kilobytes of what I'm going to show you. And imagine having 1,000 uh, 1, subways in which you can do this in a DM. So you can, you can do this operation on 8 million bits concurrently in a single DM chip, maybe more, if you can increase the power requirements of the DM chip. But basically, the primitive is triple row activation. You activate ABC concurrently. And if you do that based on chart sharing principles, what you get is a majority function, bitwise majority function. If at least two of these cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. If at least two of these cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. Clearly, bitwise majority is great. You could actually compile down to bitwise majority functions. But you can also see this as bitwise and and bitwise or by setting C appropriately. If C is 1, you get the bitwise or of A and B. If C is 0, you get the bitwise and of A and B, as you can see. I'm not going to go into the details of how we implement not, but imagine that you can implement not by taking the result at the other end of the sense amplifier and feeding into the array. Uh, and uh, essentially, that requires a little bit more work and changes to the DM chip, but it's doable. So there's a very good question. Are there any practical implementation of similar designs like this that can be used in production? I wouldn't say in production, but the same work that I uh, mentioned earlier, this is, a, this is called the compute DM work. These folks actually took our soft MC infrastructure and independently of us showed that you could do what we propose, basically this bitwise end and bitwise or and bitwise majority in some DRAM chips, even though DRAM chips are not designed to do this today. Basically, these folks show that in a fraction of the DRAM chips, by violating the timing parameters, you can get the effect of this bitwise majority function that we hypothesized using circuit simulations. And they basically said, this is doable. But of course, DRAM chips are not designed for this purpose. Now imagine what you can do if you go and design the DRAM chips so that you can exploit this effect. So that's a very good question. So I believe there is enough evidence that this uh, works in real off-the-shelf DRAM chips. In fact, we replicated their results as well in our infrastructure, and we saw the same thing. You could get this bitwise majority function in some DRAM chips. But uh, you, why you don't get in all DRAM chips? Because you cannot manipulate the timing parameters to uh, essentially mimic the effect of this triple row activation, because this is not something that is supported by DRAM chips today. This is what this is a new proposal. OK, so basically, we uh, took this and we actually mapped an application, essentially algorithm, to the devices uh, that we simulated. Uh, and this is one example. We basically accelerated database queries. We took this database application called Bitweaving that was designed to maximize bitwise operations in 2013 for another purpose, for GPUs. And we basically mapped it to our workload. And we, show, we saw significant performance improvements in query latencies. Basically, this is end-to-end -end execution time of queries. We see more than. 4x to 12x performance improvement. And the performance improvement increases with the size of the data set, of course, until your data set fits uh, to the DRAM chip. And 
If you can partition it, of course, it's better. So if you're interested, these are the papers that talk about uh, the ideas that I just mentioned. Uh, this is a more recent paper that includes not as well. And this is a book chapter that covers some future research issues over here as well. So more recently, this is very, very recent, last month actually, we showed that you can design a framework that can compile into uh, and perform any operation using what I just discussed. So this is an end-to-end -end processing using D uh, SimDRAM, is an end-to-end -end processing using DRAM framework that provides a programming interface, ISA, and the hardware support for efficiently computing complex operations, not just and or not, but complex operations as we will briefly mention. It provides the ability to implement arbitrary operations also as required uh, using the substrate that I mentioned with minimal changes to the DRAM architecture, which is about 1% of the DRAM chip area. And I'm not gonna go through the details of it, but basically uh, we have uh, the desired operation as um, and or not logic. We convert very efficient and generate very efficient majority logic based, major based on majority computation rules actually that were developed for logic synthesis. And then we generate a sequence of DRAM commands that automatically implement this. And we have a microprogram that can be executed uh, on the memory controller to take advantage of the substrate that I mentioned that uses triple row activation as well as row clone. And you could actually instantiate an instruction in your application so that you can call this microprogram. Uh, essentially, you can add new instructions. So if you want to know more about us, uh, we have papers, uh, we have the paper up as well as the videos. So I would recommend uh, taking a look at it. So with DRAM, you can actually do other things. Uh, we're looking at security primitives like physical and clonable functions, as well as random number generation, purely inside DRAM uh, by taking advantage of the latency reliability trade-off. And the basic idea over here is as you violate the latency parameters in DRAM, some cells become random number generators. Some cells fail randomly. And it can have a very high throughput and low latency random number generator based on that. So I think going forward, we need security primitives inside DRAM as well if we're going to push applications to the DRAM side. Let me give you one other example. Uh, In-memory graph processing, clearly graph analytics is important and large graphs are everywhere. This is something we worked on for, for a while, especially when we first started looking at 3D stacked memories. And scalable large-scale graph processing is challenging. Graph processing is actually very important for bioinformatics today because genomes are represented as graphs. Uh, and also uh, machine learning, many machine learning frameworks actually take advantage of, uh, of baseline gra graph processing frameworks. Uh, and graph processing is challenging because you have frequent random memory accesses and you do little amount of computation. So you basically really exercise this memory bottleneck. So the opportunity that we tried to exploit was 3D stack logic and memory. Uh, and these memories exist today in some form. High bandwidth memory is the closest one today, uh, where you actually have a logic layer and memory layer stacked on top of it. And you have high bandwidth, low latency connections between the logic and memory layers. And other two three-dimensional technologies are under development today. So I'm gonna give you a high level picture of it. The details are in the paper, but how do you take advantage of this 3D stack logic and memory chips? This is the internals of that chip. Uh, we basically internally, there are many memory controllers and we connect them using some interconnect. And we basically put very simple, low power in order cores. And the idea is we map the data uh, on top of these cores and the DRAM controllers. And you can see that the data is partitioned inside the chip. And we don't move the data, we move the computation to the data. And that's the key idea. The programming model is distributed programming, like remote function calls uh, based programming. And uh, we uh, provide the input data, uh, intermediate data values. And whenever we want to update a graph node, we send a function uh, to do the computation in the in order core that hosts the, up, uh, the graph node to be updated. And that's the basic idea. And the programming model is designed around that. It's send and receive based. It's message passing essentially inside this, as well as, to, of course, one chip is not enough because this is small. So we actually interconnect many of these chips. But of course, you want to localize the uh, data, uh, computation movement inside here as much as possible. So you want to partition your graph nicely. So we envisioned this initially as a graph processing accelerator, very, light, very much like a primitive GPU. You basically offload your computation to this non-cacheable physically addressed accelerator where the programmer programs very carefully using message passing. They partition their graph very carefully to minimize the data movement. And it's like a primitive GPU that doesn't provide even virtual memory uh, and coherence uh, characteristics uh, that modern GPUs provide. I think going forward, this may change, but uh, we, we did this just to examine the potential of the technology uh, for uh, graph processing. 
And what we found out was, and we also added prefetching mechanisms that I'm not going to talk about to improve performance. And we evaluated this system called Tesseract in comparison with the best systems that we had at the time. So this is a DDR3 system at the time, hybrid memory cube-based system, which has a lot more bandwidth. But these have processor memory dichotomy. So they're all bottlenecked by the memory bus. So if you look at Tesseract, there's no processor memory distinction, as you can see, because processing and memory are coupled within the chip. They interconnect many of these chips. As a result, you make available eight terabytes per second memory bandwidth to all of these chips and uh, all of these cores in aggregate. And the performance results are very promising. Basically, we saw that you can get four, close to 14x performance improvement on average across five important graph processing algorithms. Later work, actually, this is a work that was published in 2015. We started the work in 2012, you can imagine. Uh, later work, there's a lot of work that built upon this Tesseract work. And they basically did a lot of optimization to make the system better in many ways, uh, to basically minimize the data movement, for example, minimize the computation movement, uh, to do better partitioning of the graph, uh, to do better interrupt handling, et cetera. And they basically showed that you could get closer to two orders of magnitude, closer to 100x right now. And similarly, energy reduction is commensurate. Uh, later work improved this to also closer to two orders of magnitude. So I think the promise is there. Essentially, if you would like to learn more, you can read this paper, but we can get one to two orders of magnitude end-to-end -end performance improvement in real applications. And this is not just our work. Later work actually independently verified our results and they basically showed you can do better, which is good. Let me quickly talk about mobile devices and then I'm going to get closer to concluding. Feel free to ask more questions actually. But this is, I think, interesting because we didn't want to change the entire system over here. We wanted to be more practical and we wanted to use 3D stacked memory to accelerate some important workloads. And uh, so uh, we studied these consumer devices where energy is critically important. And we looked at these four important workloads that are being exercised right now, actually, during this call. Uh, and we quantified the energy cost of data moments in a system on chip. And I've already mentioned this number, a significant fraction of the total system energy spent on data moment. We wanted to understand the potential of moving computation close to data in a 3D stacked DRAM system like the previous example showed. The challenge here is MERS. We have limited area and energy budget in a mobile system on a chip, clearly. And basically, the key observation, the second key observation helps that challenge. Basically, we found out that simple functions often account for a significant fraction of the data movements. And we can design lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory, either using small embedded low power cores or small fixed function accelerators, or even some reconfigurable logic that we program dynamically. And I believe the future is actually heterogeneous. You really want a combination of all of these. But again, there's a lot more research that needs to be done to answer those questions. And we showed in the work by hand coding uh, these functions uh, and hand identifying these functions, you can improve the energy and performance on average by 2 to uh, 2.3 to 2.2x. So it's not as impressive as one order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, but it's also not bad because we didn't really uh, change a whole lot in the system. OK, so let me give you some example of these functions from machine learning, since machine learning is important today. Uh, machine learning inference actually goes through many layers. And it turns out a significant fraction of the inference energy is spent on data moment in TensorFlow. And a significant fraction of that data moment comes from two functions, packing and unpacking and quantization of results. And by offloading packing and unpacking and quantization on the memory side, we actually get significant benefit in terms of data moment. We also free up the CPU to do more compute intensive tasks. So that's another side benefit of offloading computation to memory units. CPU can be used for things that it is really designed for, which is computation tasks. OK, I'm not going to go into more detail, but we also look at other uh, functions over here, like compression. And decompression tends to be very important for browsing. Uh, and uh, motion estimation, for example, tends to be very important for video codecs but uh, more analysis in this paper. OK, uh, so we're getting closer to conclusion. So OK, one question is, would we still need lightweight logic for moving data if you have computing capable memory? So yes, potentially, right? Because uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot eliminate all movement in the system. And sometimes you would like to move the data to a place where it's going to be better or more efficiently processed at. And sometimes the answer is the processor. Because the processor, uh, you can build a very, uh, a uh, nice processor uh, that is very power hungry uh, that can do very good at irregular computation, 
uh, when you're not memory bound, right? In that case, you may want to move the data uh, to the processor and you may want to accelerate that movement. So data moment acceleration is certainly important uh, in my opinion, both inside the DRAM as well as outside uh, the DRAM. Okay, so let me give you a quick overview of some other works. Uh, basically, I think GPUs are also bottlenecked by memory. And we've look, been looking at how to do this processing in memory with GPUs together with NVIDIA in this particular paper, but also without NVIDIA as well with AMD. We've been looking at accelerating pointer chasing linked data structures, which turns out to be actually very latency bound, memory latency bound, accelerating dependent cache misses, which is similar, accelerating prefetching mechanisms. And more recently, we've been looking at FPGA based implementations, FPGA and HBM high bandwidth memory together, which is a closer form of putting memory closer to every configurable fabric. And we've been looking at the benefits that come with important applications like climate modeling. And we've been seeing a lot of interesting high energy efficiency and performance benefits compared to general purpose systems. And as I said, we've been looking at bioinformatics a lot. And this is a, a near data accelerator for approximate string matching. And other uh, applications we're also very interested in. Time series analysis tends to be very bottlenecked also. We design specialized accelerators for that. And we've recently looked at uh, more than 300 applications in this archive paper that we released and we're going to release the simulator as well as the benchmarks as well. But I'd recommend if you're interested in looking at this. So we characterize 300, more than 300 applications, 345 applications, and we create a benchmark suite for evaluating data moment bottlenecks. And we're going to open source it. Hopefully, the community will be able to make use of it in a nice way. So I think we, going forward, we need to revisit the entire stack, algorithms to devices, to enable a paradigm like computation and memory. But I believe we can get there step by step by taking baby steps both in the algorithm side as well as the device side. Row clone is one example of a baby step, for example. And if you're interested, we recently wrote this overview paper that covers a lot of the work in processing in memory. This was written in December, 2020. So more work clearly has happened, but hopefully this work lays out some of the challenges that uh, are there. I didn't talk about every challenge, but there are a lot of challenges to enabling a new paradigm uh, because you're changing everything in the system in the end. And there are other papers that we have also written that I would recommend. So the good news is uh, the industry is now building chips. So this is one example. Upmem company already has these modules that where basically they have a simple programmable processor with a 14 stage pipeline next to each bank in memory. And we've been evaluating it. As I mentioned earlier, we released this archive paper where we talk about uh, how this architecture, Upmem architecture, performs on real workloads that we evaluated. We also have a workload suite for it. I didn't put the picture that we have in this paper, but you can read it uh, directly from this archive link if you're interested. Uh, we'd be happy to get uh, your opinion on everything, of course. And uh, recently, Samsung, a big company, also uh, 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 released, uh, uh, provided this press release where they said that they're putting processing inside the memory in their high bandwidth memory chips. And this looks similar to some of the proposals that we had earlier, where you actually offload some instructions, simple instructions to simple pipelines um, in memory, as you can see. And they're very interested in accelerating machine learning workloads. So basically, they have uh, multiply, multiply, and accumulate instructions that are at the core of convolutions and matrix multiplication, clearly. And if you're interested, you can read their ISSCC paper, uh, and I'd recommend it. It's a short paper, but it gives some insight. So if you're interested in PIM, there are more, a lot more lectures that we provide that I don't have time for. We talk a lot about a lot of issues, uh, and you can also read them. And there's a tutorial that I provided in the International Electron Devices meeting recently that covers a lot more than what I covered in this talk, and you can find it online as well. So to conclude the second part, I think there is a huge challenge and opportunity we have for future. How do you design computing architectures with minimal data moment, more data-centric architectures, essentially? And that is fundamentally energy efficient, in my opinion. At the same time, that is fundamentally high performance. So we can actually make our systems fundamentally high performance energy efficient by minimizing data movement and by making them data centric. So I'm, as I mentioned, uh, I don't think we have more time. So I'm not going to talk about the low latency and predictable architectures and more specialized architectures for AI, ML, genomics, medicine, and health. I'm going to leave the slides with you if you're interested in going through them on your own or you may be interested in looking at some of the resources that I mentioned that cover some of these, maybe not all of these. Uh, but at this point, I think I will uh, conclude. And I'm happy to take uh, questions as well.
Well, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Onar. Uh, it's amazing. You have 400 slides, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't go through all of them, but I can, I, if, if you have time, I can go through some concluding remarks for two minutes. Uh, no, but, no, but I can... if, I, if we knew Ahmed should have arranged the workshop, not the talk, you know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I see. Uh, that's outstanding. No, no, it was fascinating, really. Uh, and the approach you presented, uh, I totally subscribe to, which is uh, starting from the algorithm all the way to the device. You know, you may know Gokan Mimic, you know Gokan Mimic from Northwestern. He's an... Uh, computer architect and yeah, yeah of course done, I, I know yeah and they've done some similar work with i published with them few papers with the same ideology so i'm i'm a believer in that but mm -hmm. uh we'll let other people ask questions so if you have any other questions i guess ahmed uh, or anyone else please take advantage of the presence of professor honor with us i think we have uh, two questions in the q a uh Okay, I, I didn't see them. Uh, uh, one of them is, uh, this is very, very informative and thanks a lot for uh, doing this. And uh, I'm a beginner and I want to know how to go about learning computer architecture. Can you please help? Should I be proficient in uh, C or C++? Okay, so that's a great question. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure where you are, but... Uh, if you're at a university, certainly you can take a computer architecture course. Uh, that's what I would recommend. But uh, you can also watch uh, the computer architecture course that we make freely available online uh, on my website and on our YouTube channel. And that's what I would recommend, frankly. Uh, you don't need to be proficient in C or C++ to understand the basics, no question about that. But at some point uh, you will uh, need to program in assembly and C and C++ certainly helps uh, to uh, uh, to, to do some of the assignments that we release at least. Uh, so I would certainly recommend going uh, and taking a look at the basic lectures, digital design and computer architecture, as well as the more advanced lectures that we put online. Hopefully that helps. Okay, one, uh, one more question is uh, just for the sake of, uh, of I guess it's, it's competent. Those performance numbers for new approaches based on modeling and simulation, or there are already prototypes available? Okay, so that, that's a good question. Basically, uh, all of the results that I presented are actually modeling and simulation. They're essentially actually a simulation, except uh, in the more recent papers that I mentioned, the Upman paper, for example, uh, if I can go back to it, somehow I cannot go back to it, but... But basically, this OpMem paper that I mentioned has real system results using the OpMem uh, memory. Well, um, also, we have some results that are coming up on real DRAM devices. So this paper that I mentioned. Here, we basically show uh, that the OpMem architecture, uh, uh, real results with the OpMem architecture, where we have uh, more than 2,500 uh, DRAM processing units, as you can see, as you can also read over here. And we see significant speed ups compared to modern CPUs and GPUs when the workload is suitable uh, for processing inside memory. If it's memory bound, for example, if you can partition it nicely across these DRAM processing units distributed across banks, then you can actually outperform a CPU and GPU greatly. And I would recommend looking at this archive paper for the most recent real system results. But some systems, of course, don't exist. Some of the systems that I mentioned that do bit block bitwise computation in memory, for example, they don't exist, at least reliably. So we cannot get real system results out of that. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, do these ideas uh, apply to cryptocurrency? Uh, are there uh, researches in this particular field? Okay, that's, that's also a good question. I'm not sure actually, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, I mean, if so if crypto, uh, cryptocurrency uh, uh, I think it needs to be examined, basically. Uh, if if uh, cryptocurrency processing, uh, whatever you would like to do over there, is memory bound, uh, and I suspect some parts of it will be, uh, then these ideas certainly would apply. Uh, but of course, that's, uh, that's an application that needs to be examined uh, and understood. So I don't know the answer uh, directly, but I suspect the answer would be yes. But a qualified answer requires more research. 
Uh, okay, uh, two or more uh, of the attendees ask is, uh, asking for the slides. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, there are multiple ways. I, I will put them on my website, but I will also send them to Ahmed um, and you can share them as you wish. Okay. But normally, normally I put the slides uh, that I present in, in public talks uh, online on my website. So at some point, these will go onto my website, but Ahmed also can share if you want, Ahmed. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, another question about uh, data mining tends to be CPU and GPU intensive, but less about memory. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a question. It seems more like a comment, but I think it really depends on the type of data mining uh, that you do. Uh, so if you're doing a lot of reducing uh, of data in databases, for example, uh, we've seen a lot of benefits uh, to do, uh, doing it on the memory side because you're eliminating the data movement essentially between the processor and memory. And if you have the functional units to do that processing efficiently on the memory side, uh, you can get a lot of uh, improvement that way. And certainly there's an energy aspect to it also, which I didn't really mention. Maybe your performance will not necessarily improve uh, compared to uh, a CPU-based system, especially if the CPU or GPU can take advantage of the locality that exists in some of these processing. In some cases, though, that locality doesn't exist, but assume that it exists. But your energy will improve because you're, you're not going to move the data as much. And you may actually be able to scale up your system if you can improve your energy without losing performance. So I have a question. Have you looked into 3D architectures where the memory is on top, maybe DRAM on top of processors and how that changes uh, yeah. all, the, all uh, the metrics? Yes, yes. So the, the, the Tesseract work that I present is actually based on 3D architectures. So we have looked mm -hmm. a lot into 3D architectures and uh, yeah. certainly that's a great substrate uh, for uh, processing in memory. So this work the, uh, at, uh, I present uh, toward the end uh, well, this is also a 3D architecture, by the way. Uh, basically, yeah, you have yeah. logic layer and memory layers. So we have looked at it in many of our works. And this was also a 3D architecture, actually. I didn't explicitly mention this. Uh, okay. But uh, the work we did with Google, for example, also looked at a logic layer underneath okay. the EM layer, as okay. well as the Tesseract work, which uh, essentially is based on uh, 3D architectures like this. But we did not look at... So what the 3D architectures we looked at was through silicon via base. So uh, yeah. They have they improve the bandwidth for sure, but I think uh, there is a new generation of 3D architectures that are coming, hopefully within the next few years. That is monolithic 3D. Uh, we'll see how it succeeds, of course, at a technological uh, level, but that's going to improve the bandwidth as well as latency characteristics uh, much more. And I think the results are going to be even more promising going into the future. So why are, are, why are we not seeing 3D architectures commercially or are there and I'm not aware of? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think there are some. Uh, so high bandwidth memory, I think, is 2.5D right now, right? And I think it's a transition to 3D. Industry is always slow at adopting new technologies for many reasons, right? Uh, certainly, reliability needs to come to a point. That's good. And uh, technology needs to mature uh, for it to get adopted. I think that's the main reason. It's, it requires some time, in my opinion, to get to that stage. <laughs> we're, already, we're already phasing out through silicon vias and going to another technology before commercializing through silicon vias. So I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. But, but I, think, I, th I actually think of 3D architectures as 3D and not necessarily uh, through silicon vias. Uh, I think as long as you have some three-dimensional uh, stacking, uh, with some sort of communication that's viably, uh, economically viable, let's say. Uh, I think that's, that's going to enable computation close to memory. Okay. Okay, so... Maybe I can conclude if, if we still have time for two minutes. Uh, I think so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, why not? Okay, sure. Uh, if, if there are more questions that come up later, I'm happy to take them also if uh, people okay. have it. Let me see. I have a lot of slides, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let me uh, finish up, let's say. So uh, I think this is the most fun, fun part of the talk maybe. Uh, and maybe this, will, uh, this can potentially actually uh, 
answer some of the questions uh, you asked uh, yeah, here at the end. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so some very famous and important architects uh, said this, uh, architecture should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. Precedent is what comes before, principle is clearly principle. And this was not a computer architect. Uh, and this was Frank Lloyd Wright, he's a very famous American architect. Yeah. Uh, he was a principled person and architect. He did not design this, which is okay, right? This is like a processor-centric design that we have today. Instead, he designed something like this, which is costly. And transition to it took a long time, basically. But this is a principal design uh, that's falling water that's very close to Pittsburgh, actually. I visited this many times. And I recommended this as an assignment to many students to go there to appreciate the creativity and thinking and principal design. And there is a principle uh, around it, which I'm not going to talk about. It's organic architecture, essentially. Uh, but the new paradigm comes at a cost. And this is a new paradigm. It came at a cost. At such a cost that the Kaufmans, who uh, actually commissioned uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to build this, basically had to say, uh, had to tell Frank Lloyd Wright, please stop. We don't have any more money to pay you. That's the end. <laughs> so uh, I think we always transitioned this, uh, we, we always experienced this cost issue and mindset issue uh, when we move to a new technology. And I think one of the reasons why 3D architectures may not be fully adopted yet is really uh, cost and mindset, maybe a combination of both also, and standards potentially, right? There are multiple issues over here. Now that I'm in Zurich, I actually give the example of train stations. I think this is a processor-centric example, analog of the train station. It looks okay, nice, works, boring. It's not like this. <laughs> this is based on some principle. This is in Zurich, Sadelhofen. This is another train station in Portugal, in Lisbon, based on some principle. This is another principle design that looks, looks similar. This is another principle design in New York, uh, Oculus. It's also at the top of a train station. It was designed by another principle thinker, Santiago Calatrava, who is an ETH alumnus actually in civil engineering. And again, uh, we experienced the same thing. Paradigm shift to a new paradigm requires cost, rethinking, mindset change. New Yorkers had to tell uh, call Java that we're not spending more than $4 billion on this, and they spent a lot. But now, now that the paradigm change is done, now that the new paradigm is there, nobody cares as much about the cost, actually. Basically, you, you pay one-time cost to move to a new paradigm, and that new paradigm changes your thinking completely. And I think of transitioning to a new paradigm, fundamentally secure computing architectures, and fundamentally energy efficient and high performance architectures like data centric, memory centric architectures similarly. We need to pay the cost and we need to, cha we need to change our mindset to get there. And I think uh, we also need to discover overarching principles for computing. Basically we've been, we have a lot of principles, no question about that, but the fundamental principle in which we design and build our computers has been processor centric. And I don't think it goes well with nature. And maybe we're uh, doing the wrong thing. And I think pe some people are realizing it with neuromorphic computers, for example, yeah. that we're not doing the right thing in the design of general purpose systems in terms of understanding and enabling an understanding of the nature. So I think going forward, we definitely need to exploit good principles. And these are some of the principles that I covered in this talk actually, without really naming them. But more than anything else, in my opinion, we need open minds. So to conclude, I think it's really time to design principled computing architectures to achieve the highest security, performance, and efficiency. We really need to discover design principles for fundamentally secure and reliable and safe computer architectures. I don't think we know these very well today. And I think we know the principles for designing complete systems to be balanced and energy efficient. We would need to be data centric and low latency, but we don't know how to apply them in the general purpose sense. Uh, and I think we also need to enable new platforms for real important applications like genomics, medicine, health, and AI, ML. I think doing all these can lead to orders of magnitude improvements. I'm giving you some examples, and more examples are in the papers that I mentioned that I didn't get a chance to cover. It can enable new applications and computing platforms and enable a better understanding of the nature as well and who knows what else. So I think the future is very bright regardless of the challenges that we faced, but we need to think across the stack and I think by doing so, we can get there step by step. And I'll mention these papers and this talk that has more detail. I'll acknowledge people who fund our research and hopefully they keep funding more. And certainly most importantly, I'll acknowledge my research group and collaborators whose work I've been talking about for uh, the seminar for sure. And you can read more about their research in this newsletter if that's interesting.
And thank you for inviting me. I hope this was useful, uh, beneficial, and yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent. And uh, you know, as a final comment from me, at least, uh, it, listening to your talk, it comes to me uh, that there needs to be some theoretical research that looks at how the architecture changes when the bottlenecks changes. Meaning, I mean. You, you're going into more locality of data and local processing and memory centric, mainly because the communications to the memory is so slow. Mm -hmm. and, and the bigger the memory is, the slower the communication to get something from that corner of the memory all the way. And so what if that changes by some new technology? Then what is the appropriate architecture? It will differ, it will, it will be different, you know? So I think, I'm not sure if that exists, but I think something like that by putting the components of performance, the processing, the memory access, the interconnect, and so on, and mm -hmm. and putting weights to those, and seeing how the architecture would change with uh, with changing the relative bottleneck or the relative delay of these components. If a technology changes this drastically, what would be the appropriate architecture? That would, because you see, there are a lot of competing architectures, as you said, and. And big companies will choose one or the other and, and invest in. And there is no clear guideline on, yeah, there is intuition and there is this, but there is no scientific clear guideline of why big this over that currently, you know? Mm -hmm. Or what if the technology changes, what will be the next one? Is that a good thing or, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so I think, yes, absolutely. I agree with you. I think uh, the way it's done today is very empirical, not theoretical, mm -hmm. right? And I think yeah. you're arguing for a more theoretical approach. And I, I absolutely agree. I think we need more, uh, theoreticians uh, yeah. working with architects as well as application the algorithm designers to really build a yeah. theory of how we can think of uh, different computing architectures and how we can map applications to different computing architectures based on the different trade-offs uh, in a simple way, right? I absolutely agree. That's what I was uh, kind of trying to get at with the theoretical foundations of computing yeah. also when I mentioned we need to really think about the data centric theory of computing, which doesn't exist to my knowledge. If people know it, of course, please share. But yes, I think what you mentioned also uh, doesn't exist to my knowledge, mm -hmm. but there's a good opportunity for research. I think maybe students who are more uh, theoretically minded uh, can, can seize that opportunity and do something good in that area, right? Maybe in your next talk in Cairo, <laughs> you will have this already done, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, well who knows right yeah. yes, it's also exactly. it's also a tough problem it's not easy uh, as well uh, yeah yeah get some smart students and, and yeah. i'd be looking forward to hearing it yeah yeah hopefully yes okay well uh, fascinating and uh, we look forward uh, forward to seeing you sure. uh, in cairo as so there, there are a couple more questions if you if you have time i'm yeah, happy yeah, sure, to sure. handle them okay yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so I see, is PIM an alternative to CPU and GPUs? I don't think we've answered this, or there are still some workloads that are still compute bound and will be more efficient to be executed on GPUs. If yes, what are these workloads? So absolutely. So certainly I'm not suggesting everything should be data centric, everything should be PIM. I think the future is extremely heterogeneous, basically. There are some workloads that are extremely compute bound and they're, they better be executed on the GPU, for example. I think matrix multiplication could be a good example if you can exploit the locality. And in our Upman paper that I mentioned in archive, for example, benchmarking a new paradigm paper, you can find examples of those workloads that do not really fit well to the Upman processing in memory architecture. And in this Damu paper where we also uh, examine, there are certainly compute bound workloads and you can find many examples of these workloads. So if your locality is great, uh, if you're not really overwhelming your uh, system by a lot of data moments, those are good examples that can be executed on CPUs and GPUs. And I think the future is heterogeneous. You, we will hopefully partition applications across these many different computing units in many different places. Okay, one more question. Is there a reason or limitation why 3D models are stacked 2D boards instead of a more intrinsic 3D model? Would a 3D CAD application work with today's technology? So that's what we were discussing basically. Today, uh, 3D uh, uh, stacking is done with not so tightly integrated, uh, uh, let's say layers. Uh, but in the future, we can become more inherently 3D and monolithically 3D. And that is really a fabrication uh, and bonding uh, type of issue. That's beyond my expertise for sure, but there are people who are uh, working on it in the world and uh, they see some promising results. And if you're interested in this, I think one 
one nice example is uh, the project at Stanford, the next project, N3XT, they call it. And they use carbon nanotubes, for example, to actually connect these different uh, layers. And I think that's very promising. Of course, it's a bit early uh, to be extremely general purpose, but uh, that, that gives you a much tighter integration across these different layers. Okay, there's one more comment, uh, which is a funny comment. Hopefully, owner updates his website more than once a year, like some people in computer architecture. I assure you that uh, I do, actually. So I think you can find my most recent talk uh, from two weeks ago on my website, on my talk section, and hopefully most recent publications as well. Uh, but uh, I will uh, put this talk also as soon as I can. Hopefully, I'll try it after this, uh, after this seminar. <laughs> Professor Honor has a low, low, low latency architecture, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, sometimes it tends to be unpredictable, but I try yeah. to be low latency. <laughs> yes, great, outstanding. So uh, thank you again. Any questions, anything else? I think we had a great night today, actually, I enjoyed it. So thank you, thank you so much. It was really fun. And as I said, we look forward to having you physically in Cairo, where we can have more fun. And. Uh, Best uh, great night for everyone, Ahmed. You can close this and say whatever you want. Thank you, Yahya. That, I guess that's it. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, thank I, you I think I'm, I mean, Ahmed is muted. I think he's saying something, but we cannot hear him. Yeah, yeah. Ahmed, uh, if you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Honor, for your uh, great uh, talk today. And uh, hopefully, we can invite you physically in, uh, in Egypt and in future university in Egypt. Uh, also, thank you, Professor uh, Yahya, for uh, uh, for uh, your hosting for this uh, lecture. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the students of uh, IEEE Future University Student Branch as well. And uh, thank you all for attending the Future uh, Computing Architecture webinar. And uh, hopefully, to see you in the next coming. Uh, webinars and seminars at the branch. Thank you all and good night. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good Have night. A good night.